It's 19 minutes before 1 o'clock. This is Country Fair from WGN Radio in Chicago. It's time for news for dairy farmers, a program brought to you by Pure Milk Association. Here is a bulletin from WGN News just handed me. President Kennedy has been shot and seriously wounded. An American president shot dead in the street. It's 10 minutes before 1 o'clock, and all other news that we might bring you on our country fair show today is paled indeed by the tragic news from Dallas, Texas. And here is the president of the United States. President John F. Kennedy assassinated in broad daylight. It was boom, boom, boom. A defining day for a generation. We cried along with everybody. The official investigations leaving open questions. What you're suggesting is that there was a conspiracy to kill the president. The evidence in the case will not permit a single gunman to have done this. 60 years later, the government still keeping secrets classified. Is that smoking gun proof of conspiracy? No. It is smoking gun proof that the CIA lied to the Warren Commission. Tonight, News Nation explores the latest shocking revelations. In my mind, it was like, wait a minute, that's, that's my boy. And lingering mysteries. I know there was a cover-up, a massive cover-up, and it goes on and on. Including a rare interview with Abraham Zapruder, the man whose footage became a worldwide obsession. How many shots did you hear? Well, that's a question that uh, came up quite a few times. The fight over a film from another angle. His footage was the only angle facing the JFK motorcade and the area known as the Grassy Knoll. Reflections from the journalists who broke the story wide open. Whatever the government is holding back in that evidence will tell us a clearer picture. And the Kennedy's legacy of service to this country. Ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. It's up to us to continue to pass these values on to our children and grandchildren. It all starts now in this News Nation special report, Unsolved, the JFK assassination. G'day, welcome to this News Nation special. I'm your correspondent, Ross Coulthard. It's confronting, chilling, 60 years on, to think of what happened here. The cold-blooded murder of the leader of the free world during the darkest days of the Cold War. A tragedy amplified, I think, by the fact that JFK lived his life in the public gaze. He was the first television president. People empathized with him as a doting dad, the loving husband of a beautiful wife, and even his political rivals admired him as an effective, charismatic politician. The murder of JFK endures as an epic American tragedy, a scar on our history. Mums and dads had brought their kids here in their Sunday best to greet the president, to welcome him to Texas. Instead, what they witnessed was a brutal execution. It was an event that was witnessed all over the world and shared in horror by hundreds of millions of people. They were all asking the same question. Was this a conspiracy or was this a lone shooter? some kind of crazed gunman who'd acted alone. The evidence increasingly points to another gunman behind the fence there on the grassy knoll. And as you'll see today from first-hand witnesses and investigators who've reinvestigated the case, there is now the disturbing possibility that what happened here 60 years ago has been concealed in a grubby cover-up, a curtain of lies concealing the unthinkable. His rendezvous with grim destiny begins a little after noontime as his plane lands in Dallas. November 22nd, 1963. I thought, only in America. Pretty day, flags, people, 
Here's the President of the United States. John F. Kennedy and First Lady Jacqueline Kennedy taking Texas by storm as they crisscrossed the Lone Star State to unify the Democratic Party and kick off Kennedy's 1964 re-election campaign. The celebrated couple flew into Dallas Love Field on Air Force One where a Lincoln Continental convertible waited to take them and the Texas governor through crowds in downtown Dallas. There was a lot of uh, anxiety that morning among the police officers because uh, we were very happy that the uh, president was going to be in town. Thousands lined the 10-mile route as the presidential motorcade made its way towards downtown Dealey Plaza. I hollered at him. Welcome, Mr. President. They were just gorgeous people, big, like bigger, bigger, bigger than life. And the crowd is absolutely going wild. This is a friendly crowd in downtown Dallas. Covering streets and sidewalks, at some points, the crowd was several rows deep. We heard people saying, they're coming, they're coming. I pushed my way forward and just as they were approaching us, something happened. We turned the corner into uh, Dealey Plaza, and then there was a bang, bang, like that. I said, those are shots. Stop the bus. The air was filled with the most unbelievable sound. It, the, the screaming of thousands of people. It's as though 30 choirs had all gone berserk. President John F. Kennedy the 35th president of the United States was shot once in the neck and then again in the back of the head. So we heard the first shot and the president, I don't know who was hit first, but the president jumped up in his seat and I thought it scared him. I thought it was a firecracker because he looked, you know, fair. And then as the car got directly in front of us, well, a gunshot apparently from behind us hit the president in the side, side of the temple. Kennedy's head just literally exploded. You know, I saw tissue and everything. It was 12.30 p.m. when the convertible turned off Main Street at Dealey Plaza. It's only a matter of minutes before he arrives at the trademark. Something has happened in the motorcade route. Stand by, please. This is the official version of what happened. The assassin Lee Harvey Oswald used a rifle to shoot President Kennedy from the sixth floor of the Texas School Book Depository. The first bullet pierced Kennedy in the back of the neck, exiting through his throat before striking the Texas governor. People were running different directions, people were covering up their children. The crowd just became a mob and everybody was running down the middle of Main Street. Kennedy toppled over, just went on over into Jackie's lap. Something has happened in the motorcade route. Something, I repeat, has happened in the motorcade route. Secret Service agent Clint Hill jumped on top pushing Mrs. Kennedy back inside the vehicle and covering her and the president. The motorcade rushed to Parkland Hospital, where 30 minutes later, President John F. Kennedy was pronounced dead. Shocked supporters rushed to Parkland Hospital, crying, hugging, grieving the loss, as police tracked down the alleged assassin Lee Harvey Oswald. Less than an hour after shooting Kennedy, Oswald shot and killed Dallas police officer J.D. Tippett. Shortly afterward, Dallas police found Oswald hiding in a movie theater, where he was arrested and charged. And I remember him saying, um, I didn't shoot anybody, I'm just a patsy. Two days later, as live television covered Oswald moving through the basement of the Dallas Police Department headquarters, Oswald was shot by local nightclub owner Jack Ruby. I witnessed the president being killed, then I witnessed Oswald being killed. Everybody was around Oswald, and he just jumps out and shoots him. After conducting roughly 25,000 interviews and chasing down tens of thousands of leads, the FBI said it concluded that Lee Harvey Oswald acted alone. The Warren Commission, established by President Lyndon Johnson to investigate Kennedy's death, spent nearly a year studying the assassination, compiling an 889-page final report, and it agreed that Oswald acted 
alone. On the day of JFK's funeral in Washington, D.C., within days of the assassination, there was a young man and his girlfriend in the crowd watching the awful procession unfold. His name is Josiah Thompson. He's a private investigator and former university professor who has devoted much of his life, nearly 60 years, to investigating the JFK assassination. His mind is as sharp today as it was back then about what he believes really happened on that terrible day here in Dealey Plaza. Why does this case matter? Because this case set the t tonality for the intervening 60 years. We still do not definitively know who killed JFK. I think, that's, I think that's true. I think that's true. We should know, shouldn't we? The public's got a right to know. A healthy society requires that we know the answers to these sorts of questions. So the evidence to you is indisputable that there were two shooters, minimum? Yes. Well, two, two indisputable, three po possible. You're in no doubt whatsoever that on the evidence, there was a shooter on the grassy knoll. Had to be. And they fired the fatal shot. There were two volleys of shots. One of those shots was fired too close to the other two to have come from Oswald's rifle. All the way up, then all the way back, then all the way forward, all the way down. One of those shots which killed Kennedy was fired from the knoll. The final shot was fired from the sixth floor window of the depository. The official explanation in the Warren Commission is that this one bullet caused seven separate injuries. Do you believe that theory? Oh, no. No, of course not. If he was hit from the front, just to explain to our audience, it could not possibly have been Lee Harvey Oswald no. who fired the kill shot. Right. And you've assembled, I think, quite a persuasive body of circumstantial but persuasive evidence to suggest that multiple witnesses saw somebody doing something on the grassy knoll. Yes. And that is a full blow off. See, that looks like the top of a hat. So that may be the person that killed JFK. And do you believe that was ever properly investigated by the FBI or any of the investigators assigned to this investigation? No, you, you see this in, in reading the FBI 302s, which are their investigative reports of, of interviewing wit witness X, say, because their questions, <laughs> they're all afraid of Hoover, and they know Hoover wants what the Warren Commission wanted. So they were working, you believe, to a preconceived agenda. They know what Hoover wanted, right? And what they know Hoover, what, what their did, boss wanted. What they did the boss want? <laughs> he wanted this to be proof that Lee Harvey Oswald did it. There has to have been official involvement by government agencies to cover up what really happened. The overall scenario of to what happened is of a professional hit. Right. Okay. Now, the government officials who are faced with this and who, who, who have the assassination of the president on their hands, they may not have had anything to do with this. And undoubtedly, most, most of the government officials who were involved in investigating the Kennedy assassination had nothing to do with it. So is it your hypothesis that there was a cover-up but they, they made it sure that on the public appearance, at least, it was Oswald, purely and simply because they didn't like the consequences if the public realized there was a conspiracy. I think that, that is inescapable. In, in other words, that yes, decisions were made. Decisions were made that we're going to, okay, gents, we're going to have to fix this, right? We can't have the President of the United States assassinated by person or by persons unknown and let that be. That's not a stable position for our society to, to embrace. So we'll fix it a little. Was any of this evidence that you're talking about taken into consideration by the Warren Commission? No. Or the House Select Committee on Assassinations? No. 
Do you believe it was deliberately covered up? I don't know. This evidence has been around since I wrote Six Seconds in 19, was published in 1967. Nobody's laid a glove on it. Do you think part of what motivated the cover-up was that they knew that if Lee Harvey Oswald had faced trial, he probably would have been exonerated? I think if he'd had a defense attorney equipped with the evidence that we have now, any jury would have acquitted Oswald because he couldn't have done it. He can't be in two places at the same time. The government is still resisting release of records relating to the JFK assassination. But I think that's largely just agency stupidity, that, that government agencies are very reluctant to have any of their documents released to the press for God knows what reason. Um, Look, the, the secret to the Kennedy assassination is not s sitting on some piece of paper in a government file. It just didn't, folks. News Nation correspondent Evan Lambert has been digging into the declassified files. But more importantly, he's been asking the question, why have some of those files still not been released? So we didn't know who was reading Oswald's mm. mail. For nearly 60 years, the American public never knew who sent this June 22nd, 1962 memo. It came from a CIA employee regarding the agency's secret operation to read the mail of Lee Harvey Oswald. That monitoring ran from 1960 to 1962, but questions have persisted for years. The person who wrote the memo was Ruben Efron, according to one of the last batches of JFK assassination files released by the U.S. government at the end of June 2023. The documents don't explain Efron's significance, but reveal him to be the spy, noting about Oswald, quote, addressee is a former American who defected to the Soviet Union. He also wrote in his report that a letter from Oswald's mother sent to Oswald and his wife in Minsk may be of interest to other CIA employees and the FBI. JFK assassination historian Jefferson Morley. What the letter tells us is Lee Harvey Oswald was interested in reading George Orwell, author of a dystopian novel about a surveillance society, that private belief is intercepted by an illegal CIA surveillance operation, and the CIA takes notice and says, we're interested in this guy. Recent disclosures from the National Archives as part of the 1992 JFK Records Act, shining a light on facts about the assassination unknown to the majority of the public, some even to this day. Like this memo, written by CIA officer Donald Heath Jr. in 1977, he describes getting orders to investigate another theory of the Kennedy assassination that differed from the lone gunman official story. Heath writing that in the days after Kennedy's murder, he and other agents were asked by superiors to question sources about, and this is just one example, quote, Cuban exiles or Cubano-Americans you consider to be capable of orchestrating the murder of President Kennedy. In the immediate aftermath of the assassination, at a time when the White House, the FBI, the Dallas police, the Secret Service, and all of the national media were saying, don't worry, folks, it was one guy alone who did it. The CIA itself did not believe that. According to the National Archives and Records Administration, an estimated 320,000 documents regarding President Kennedy's assassination have been reviewed. Of those, 99% have been released. Just over 4,600 are still fully or partially secret, about half under the purview of President Biden, and the other half kept secret for other reasons, like court orders, grand jury rules, and limits prescribed to those who donated the records, many being withheld by the CIA. People are going to be suspicious and not crazed conspiracy theorists, but like a lot of people, like a lot of people around JFK, they think, the government knows something that they're not telling us. Evan Lambert, News Nation. Coming up, the film that changed everything, the Zapruder film, the man who secured a rare interview with Abraham Zapruder. I cajoled, I pleaded, and used good old fashioned charm to convince him to do the interview. Also, Robert Groden, the man who copied the Zapruder film and leaked it for international consumption. 
So you believe that people in the CIA were involved? In the killing of the president? Yeah, oh, yeah. Welcome back. The Zapruder film is perhaps the most important vision showing what really happened at the very moment of the Kennedy assassination. It's graphic and it's very confronting, but we don't know a lot about what the person who shot it thought as he saw it through the viewfinder. That person, of course, was Abraham Zapruder, and he was a very private man, not wanting to give very many interviews. But one person who did secure an interview with him was Marvin Scott from our New York affiliate, WPIX. Marvin joins us now. Abraham Zapruder, an unassuming dress manufacturer, is the man behind the iconic video record of an unforgettable and scarring moment in history. Zapruder and his Bill and Howell camera were, simply put, at the right place at the right time. How did you come to be standing on this grassy knoll with your camera, being the only man who got the account, the full account, of this horrible assassination? Well, first of all, I uh, believe I wouldn't have had the pictures at all if it wasn't for my secretary, Mrs. Rogers, who made me go home and get the camera. I didn't have a camera with me at all that morning. And uh, she insisted I go home and get the camera. Zapruder checked out three spots before finally positioning himself at the lower left corner of this grassy knoll in front of the Texas School Book Depository building. It was a perfect vantage point to film the president's motorcade. I saw the motorcycles, then the car approached, and uh, Jacqueline and the president were waving. And as it came in line with my camera, I heard a shot. I saw the president lean over to Jacqueline, then the second shot came. And then I realized I saw his head open up and I started yelling, they killed him, they killed him. And I continued shooting till he went under the underpass. It's uh, left in my mind like a wound that heals up, but yet there's some pain left as to what has happened. The film is only 26.6 seconds, but in the years afterward, it has gone through thousands of hours of frame by frame scrutiny and has been the centerpiece of every official investigation. The Warren Commission relied on it heavily in reaching their conclusion that Lee Harvey Oswald acted alone. But the film has also fueled multiple conspiracy theories. The footage was not widely seen until it made its TV debut on Geraldo Rivera's show, Good Night America, in 1975. Shortly after, the public saw the assassination themselves. Congress voted to establish a select committee on assassinations to reinvestigate the assassination. The committee's conclusion? That there was, quote, probably a second gunman who shot from the grassy knoll, right behind where Zapruder was standing when he shot the film. But Zapruder, the man who captured history for the nation, says he did not hear a second gunman. Do you feel the shots perhaps came from behind the fence or behind you on the grassy knoll? No, as a matter of fact, I heard some uh, comments about us, and I went back to the place where I stood when I shot these pictures and looked to that uh, wooden fence that we're talking about. I believe it's about between 30 or 35 feet away from where I was standing. I believe I would have heard different sound, a shot coming from my, uh, coming from my right ear. Abraham Zapruder died in 1970, a quiet, unassuming man who never expected to be immortalized, particularly by a horrible moment in history. So Marvin, Abraham Zapruder was a notoriously shy interviewee. How did you get the interview? He was extremely shy and he tried his darndest to stay away from the media. And the best way to describe it is, as his granddaughter describes it in her book, 26 Seconds, I cajoled, I pleaded, and used good old fashioned charm to convince him to do the interview. It took about 15, 20 minutes. He kept pleading, Marvin, please, I appreciate your request, but I wish not to do an interview. I engaged him in conversation. I knew he was a New Yorker until the age of 15. He grew up in Brooklyn. I was a kid from the Bronx. So I engaged him in conversation talking about New York, Brooklyn versus the Bronx. And I said, come on, Mr. Z, you can't turn a 
way a kid from the other borough, and we seemed to bond after a while. And he said, okay, come on over at 2 o'clock. And once I got there at 2 o'clock at his office, I got a bit greedy, and I said, how about doing the interview downstairs where you stood on that day on November 22nd? And he agreed to do it. We stood near where you're standing right now. Uh, he found a concrete abutment to get secure so he could be in a position to see the motorcade as it came along. And he was in an excellent position to film the presidential motorcade. To the day I interviewed him, he did not understand where he found the strength to stay there and hold the camera as securely as he did after witnessing the murder of the president. So you've had the unique opportunity, Marvin, to talk to the guy who was literally looking through the viewfinder at the very moment the president died. He probably had the clearest look at what really happened. From what he told you, what do you think really happened that day? I have been influenced by what uh, Mr. Zapruder told me and his assistant, Marilyn Sitzman, and I have believed, based upon what they told me, that there was a single shooter and that that shooter would have been Lee Harvey Oswald. The reason being, they told me they heard two distinct shots, and they came from the left and rear of where they were standing, which would have been the Texas School Book Depository Building. In the mid-1960s, Life magazine bought the Zapruder film, and the man who processed that film was a guy called Robert Groden. He was so shocked by what he saw on the film, he kept his own copy. And when, to his disappointment, Life magazine only ran single shots from the film in their magazine report, he decided it was important to come forward seeing that film convinced Groden that there was something improper about the killing of JFK. He's written multiple books, participated in multiple documentaries, and he's as convinced today as he was back then that this is and was a massive conspiracy. That, that's very important, what you're hearing, because there was a sound recording made of the actual shots Defenders of the, War, of the Warren Commission and the single board theory claim that uh, the, 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 the uh, recording was made in the plaza. In the background, on that tape, you can hear that, that, that gong going off, the bell going off, which proves that it was done here. You assert that there was a conspiracy to murder the president. Absolutely. There was more than one shooter. It's one more than one conspiracy, which is what made it so hard, too. The who question, done it? Who done it? Nobody really knows for sure. My answer to that question usually is not Lee Harvey Oswald. You don't think Os Oswald was involved at all? He couldn't have been. Well, not involved at all, it's hard to say. He it's wasn't a shooter. There were four of us who worked on the acoustics evidence. I was one of the four. In the Library of Congress, I transferred a Zapruder copy from the Secret Service copy, which has no splices in it, with the actual sound recording. And we found that there were more shots than the, uh, than the government admitted to. What's the most compelling piece of evidence that you believe blows the lone gunman theory out of the water? When the president is struck in the head, we have to go to uh, Second law of physics, Newton's law of physics, that is uh, transfer of momentum. The bullet hits him in the head and throws him backwards and to the left. That's major. That, I say the Zapruder film is number one. People know me for releasing the Zapruder film, which doesn't show people running to the knoll because he stopped filming. But several other people show probably pretty close to 200 people rushing toward the knoll, chasing the assassin not just heard the shots, but saw the smoke too. And how many of those people were featured in the evidence presented in the public volumes of the Warren Commission? Virtually none. The Warren Commission, when they went to speak to witnesses, went to the Dallas police reports. And anyone who said that there was more than one shooter or shots came from another direction were pretty much ignored. 
even a policeman gave evidence that he confronted a man when he ran around behind the fence there, thinking yeah. he'd heard shots coming from that direction. Right. And there was a man who didn't look like a service agent who showed him Secret Service credentials. Right. That's in evidence. It's in evidence. And in my book, I've published two photographs of the guy up there. He was photographed, but no one's been able to identify him. What did the Warren Commission say about that? Uh, they didn't. Oswald was a CIA agent. And, and you base your assertion that he was a CIA agent on the McCone memo, which is a still classified CIA memo that you have in your book. And you obtained that when you were working on the Assassinations Committee. That's correct. I saw it. The director of the House Committee saw it. Lord knows how many other people saw it, too. The conspiracy to kill him is obvious. Is what what happened. The cover-up could have been the same people, but it could have been uh, a need to cover it up to prevent World War III. What do you think is the more plausible explanation about what was going on in reality? The CIA wanted the war in Vietnam to escalate. The president was going to end the war. He said that. He was going to end the war right after the uh, next election in 64. If that had happened, the CIA would have lost a tremendous amount of, of authority over world politics. Uh, they were making a lot of money off the Vietnam War. Uh, they had a lot of uh, backing for the things that they were doing around the world because of that. John Kennedy was going to end all that. It would, co would have cost them a fortune and a lot of their uh, influence. I've been doing this now for 60 years. I started doing this on my 18th birthday, November 22nd, 1963. And here it is, 60 years later, and I'm still doing it. And we still don't know what really happened. That's right. We, well, we, we know a lot more than they wanted us to know. A lot more. But we don't know it all. Maybe someday we will. Coming up, the other assassination film you likely haven't heard about and the stunning new revelations from the Secret Service agent who was here on that fateful day. I didn't think in all the confusion everything, but I figured the bullet had been found. You'd think 60 years on, if there was another piece of film that showed what happened here on that fateful day in 1963, we'd be allowed to see it. But incredibly, there was another film shot by a guy called Orville Nix, just down here on the grass below me. News Nation correspondent Nancy Liu has been investigating this story and talking to the Nix family. It's just six seconds of silent eight millimeter footage from the moment that changed the course of American history. The president being shot, the first lady climbing onto the trunk, also filmed from a clearer angle by Abraham Zapruder. Standing across from Zapruder in this area of Dealey Plaza was a Dallas maintenance worker named Orville Nix Sr. And his footage was the only angle facing the JFK motorcade and the area known as the Grassy Knoll. Grainy still frames from copies of the Nix film have been examined for decades. These images are exhibits in a new lawsuit seeking the original footage. Zapruder is seen standing on a pedestal, but could these images, enhanced in the 70s, be those of a second gunman? Days after the tragedy, Orville Nix sold his film to United Press International, but when they gave it back to him, they gave him a copy, and no one seems to know what happened to the original. Gail Nix Jackson is suing the National Archives, accusing the government of mishandling the film. She refused an interview due to the suit, but she tells News Nation, I've been on this quest since 1988. I so hope we find truth and answers and my grandfather's film. A House committee subpoenaed the original Nix film from UPI in 1978. That review concluded the assassination was probably the result of a conspiracy with a high probability that Lee Harvey Oswald did not act alone. He only paid $8 a week for this room. 71-year-old Patricia Hall was 11 in 1963 and knew Oswald as a tenant in her grandmother's rooming house. Hall now owns the home, offering tours for extra income. This is the original bed that he slept on. 
She also thinks the next film could hold answers, but believes government forces worked to prevent that long ago. I think the actual evidence that would take us to the smoking gun has already been destroyed. Nancy, you've had an opportunity to speak to the Nix family. Can you tell us what are the theories inside the Nix family about why the government is potentially hiding what's on the Nix film? Yeah, they want an explanation from the government exactly why they're suing the federal government for the Nix film back. Has it been destroyed? Is it part of a conspiracy? The Nix film is the only footage that faces the grassy Noel Ross. And as you know, witnesses have described puffs of smoke from the grassy knoll, hearing the sound of gunfire from the grassy knoll. And the next film, after the assassination, you see people running towards the grassy knoll, apparently to try and catch somebody back there. So that's why there are so many people who want the original Nick's film to be able to see it, to be able to analyze it, because it is now 60 years old. Where it may be, nobody knows, but if we can find it, we could use AI, new technology, perhaps enhance that original film to find out, is there a second or maybe a third shooter on the grassy knoll? Does the next film show that? Coming up, the stunning revelations of the former Secret Service agent who was here. I had said Mrs. Kennedy went into the room. I just didn't say that I followed her in. What Paul Landis tells us now upends the entire Warren Commission theory that Lee Harvey Oswald acted alone. Joining me now is former Secret Service agent Paul Landis, who was quite literally standing on the running board of the limousine directly behind JFK, he now says he found a cartridge from that Manlika Kakano rifle fired by Lee Harvey Oswald. Now that begs the question, if he found the cartridge in the back of the car, where did the other bullet come from that was found in Governor Connolly's thigh? Paul Landis joins us now. I'm telling you what I did was I picked that bullet up, took it into trauma room one, and placed it by the president's feet. That's a fact. Do you accept that your new evidence, if it's true, if it's accurate, raises significant doubts about the so-called magic bullet theory, which is essentially a fundamental tenet to holding together the Warren Commission's conclusion that Lee Harvey Oswald acted alone. I just, I mean, re knowing what I know and, and what I wrote in my book, um, it has to support everything. I'm just trying to understand, in your statements that you gave subsequently, where you were questioned about what happened that day, did you acknowledge in your statement that you had found that bullet and that you'd placed it on the president's stretcher? No, I, I did not. It was, I just think under the stress and everything, we were asked to, uh, after all this, we'd gone through the uh, four days and then two days in uh, Hyannisport with Mrs. Kennedy, and we got back. And uh, I think just the lack of sleep, whatever, I didn't even think about it, entering it. It's very important that I understand that you say that you went into the trauma room because a few people have picked you up on an inconsistency because in your earlier statements that you gave back in the 1960s, you never said you went into the trauma room with Mrs. Kennedy. How do you explain that disparity? Well, I, I had said Mrs. Kennedy went into the room. I just didn't say that I followed her in. Um, that's all we were, when we wrote the statement, um, it was after we'd had uh, a weekend of basically four days lack of sleep. And it, I, telling the story, uh, telling it in my statement, I just, uh, it was, I just didn't see her. I guess I didn't feel it was important. I just said she went in and she came out. That's how I was reporting it. I just wrote 
All I wanted to do was tell people what I saw and what I did, and hopefully that this would end this, some of the conspiracy theories that were out there. Um, that's for other people. I'm not an expert. Those are for other people to figure out. The, the irony is, of course, that your evidence has even now intensified the conspiracy theories because it has added weight to many people's theories that there was another shooter on the grassy knoll. All I'm trying to tell people is what I saw and, and what I did. Um, who knows what's going to come of this? I hope they, I hope they, uh, they release these documents that uh, haven't been released, and maybe we'll find some truth there that'll help. Coming up, is there any hope at all that we will ever know the real story of what happened to JFK? As you'll see, investigator Josiah Thompson has his doubts. Do you think we'll ever get an answer? It's the president. It's JFK. Yeah. And the implications of that evidence are that JFK was murdered by multiple shooters in a conspiracy that was covered up. I don't think there's any question of that. And we still don't know the answers. And I want to tell you, I'm giving up. At this point, I've done what I can. And I'm 88, I'm 88 years old, and my wife and I are going to go off and have some fun now. Do you think we'll ever get an answer? No. No. In the end, we just don't know enough to be sure. But I think we're at the point now where this new evidence requires reinvestigation. Let's hope that a future US government has the courage to allow a reinvestigation of this, one of the greatest mysteries in US history. I'm Ross Coulthard, reporting for News Nation from Dealey Plaza, Dallas, Texas. Thank you for joining me.